unpack the mystery behind 3-1 Atlas, we talk to a physicist who is chasing the truth of this cosmic object. Imagine this. Far out in the dark, beyond the familiar paths of our planets, a visitor is rushing towards our part of space. It is moving fast, very fast, about 137,000 miles per hour. If it were a solid shiny object, some early math said it would need to be as big as Manhattan to look this bright. That line alone makes people pause. What exactly is coming? A comet, an asteroid or something that does not fit the usual boxes? The object has a name, 3i Atlas. The 3i means it is the third interstellar visitor we've ever seen. The third thing known to come from outside our solar system and pass through it. The first was Oumuamua, the second was Borisov. Both surprised us. This one is surprising us in new ways. Some even asked, half seriously and half curiously, what if it is not just a rock? We do not need to jump to big claims. We can walk through the story slowly in clear words and let the clue speak. The story began on what looked like an ordinary night of sky scanning. The Atlas survey in Hawaii was taking images as it always does, catching faint moving points among a sea of stars. Those images were then checked by advanced software using algorithms inspired by quantum methods. Think of that as a very smart pattern finder that can look at many possibilities at once. It flagged something odd. The moving point did not behave like a simple comet. Its brightness did not just rise and fall with distance, it pulsed in a rhythm almost like a heartbeat hidden inside noise. Its tail of dust, which should point away from the sun, seemed to have a part pointing toward the sun. And when astronomers looked for the usual chemical signs in its light, what we call the spectrum, they saw almost nothing at first. The light was there, the dust was there, but the usual gases that tell us this is a normal comet waking up were not there. To understand why that is weird, it helps to know a very basic rule about comets. When a comet warms up in sunlight, its ices turn into gas. That gas and tiny dust grains get pushed by light and the solar wind. The tail then points away from the sun. It's like a flag pulled back by a steady breeze. And when the ice turns to gas, those gases glow at specific colors. Cyanogen and diatomic carbon are two common ones. They show up again and again in comet spectra. They are the smoke that tells us the fire of warming has begun. But in the first weeks after 3i Atlas was found, the spectra were almost blank. No cyanogen, no diatomic carbon, nothing strong. It was like seeing a fire with bright sparks, but no smoke column at all. Only much later, after months, did a faint trace of cyanogen finally appear. It was late and weak and still did not match the strong dust activity seen in the images. The order was upside down. Dust first, gas later. That is not what the comet instruction book says should happen. The size question added a second layer of confusion. If you assume the brightness is just sunlight reflecting off a solid body, then yes, you might estimate something huge, even 20 kilometers wider than Manhattan. But careful work with stacked images from Atlas, plus follow-up from Hubble and the James Webb Telescope gave a range for the nucleus, the solid central piece between about 0.3 km and 5.6 km across. That is still large for an interstellar visitor. Oumuamua was likely less than 200 meters long. Borisov was about a kilometer. This new one might be five times that or more. Some of the brightness is probably not the core itself, but the dust cloud around it which we call the coma, and maybe a reflective surface. Yet no matter how you slice it, this thing is on the big side for something from between the stars. And it seems to be a single body, not a swarm of fragments pretending to be one thing. Night after night, instrument after instrument, the data point to one main object, an ancient traveler made of material born in the disk of a different star. Its path through our solar system is also remarkable. Models from NASA and JPL traced a route through the inner planets that does not look like a random flyby. On October 5, 2025, it will pass Mars at about 0.19 astronomical units, which is roughly 28 million kilometers. About four weeks later, it will skim closest to the Sun, its perihelion, racing around 68 kilometers per second. 
then on November 3rd 2025 it will pass inside Earth's orbit and come as close as about 0.65 astronomical units to Venus. Each of these steps has been computed with careful tools that track the dance of planets and small bodies. The path bends a little as gravity tugs it, but overall it is still a hyperbola, an open curve that will fling it back into interstellar space once it's done with its visit. What makes people stare is not that the physics is wrong, but that the timing and angles line up in a way that looks almost planned. Mars, then Sun, then Venus, all in a narrow window. It feels like threading a needle between moving targets. If those calculations hold, Earth will get its own close look in mid-December around the 17th. Close here does not mean danger. There is no collision in these models. It means close enough for good observations from many places. It will be a watch window, a chance to test many ideas at once. When dynamicists tried to answer how likely this specific sequence is, they used Monte Carlo simulations. That's a fancy way of saying they ran billions of random scenarios to see how often something similar happens by chance. They kept the speed and entry angle similar and they let the planets keep moving as they would. Most of the time, the object missed by big distances, tens or hundreds of millions of kilometers. Only a tiny fraction matched the observed sequence. Close to Mars, then close to Venus, then out past Jupiter's orbit months later. One researcher compared it to being blindfolded, throwing a dart at a spinning globe, hitting a small city, then letting the globe spin again, throwing a second dart and hitting a second specific city, and then doing it a third time. The odds don't just add up, they multiply. Some will say that with enough interstellar visitors, rare paths will happen. That's fair. But right now, our sample size is 3. And only this one is taking this strange route. That is why people are paying attention. The pulse in the light was another surprise. A comet's brightness can vary because of distance, because of dust jets turning on and off, and because the nucleus spins and shows different faces to the sun. Usually that variation is messy and irregular. This time, the software found a repeating signal that sat on top of the mess, steady and sharp. It was as if you were listening to the noise of a storm and underneath it, you could hear a metronome ticking at exactly the same interval again and again. The algorithms tested many periods from minutes to days across many nights and many color filters. The signal passed hard statistical checks. Teams cross-checked with Hubble and with ground-based telescopes. The pattern remained. It did not match the spin rate you would expect for a nucleus the size many people think this is. It did not line up with a simple orbital resonance either. It was just there, persistent, like a clock you did not expect to find. Then came the gentle push. When astronomers plot a path for a comet, they usually start with gravity alone. The sun and planets pull, and the object responds. Sometimes, however, they see a small difference between the path predicted by gravity and the actual path. That extra bit is called non-gravitational acceleration. With comets, this often comes from outgassing. When ice is turned to gas, the jets act like tiny thrusters and can nudge the nucleus this way or that. But the odds and the size of the nudge depend on the size of the object and the level of activity. For 3i Atlas, the measured acceleration early on was larger than you would expect from sunlight pressure alone for a body this big. And it appeared before the normal gas signature showed up strongly in the spectrum. In other words, the push seemed to arrive before the clear smoke signals, which is backward from the usual movie. This left the community with two main ideas and several smaller ones. The first idea is a hard crust. Over billions of years in deep space, the surface of an interstellar body can get baked by radiation and micrometeor strikes. It can form a crust that hides inner ices. That could delay the gas signatures and the first dust might come from weak spots or from grains shaken loose by micro cracks before the gases vent in the usual way. The second idea is stranger but still natural, shape and reflectivity. If the nucleus has a thin, broad shape, something like a natural fragment of a sheet, and if it is reflective, then sunlight could push it more strongly than expected, a bit like a light sail. That would make the acceleration larger without much gas. A combination of weak delayed outgassing, unusual shape and spin could explain parts of the data. But no single model cleanly explains everything at once. The sunward dust, the delayed chemistry, the early sideways push, and the steady rhythm in the light. The tail remains a stubborn puzzle. The simplest rule that every beginner learns is that a comet's tail points away from the sun. That is because light and solar wind sweep dust and gas outward. Yet images of this object show a component of dust on the sun-facing side. 
it is not what the rule book says. Some researchers suggest that the spin axis might be tipped just so, keeping certain surface regions always lit and others always shaded, making dust fall and stream in odd ways. Others argue that the dust grains here could be larger or heavier than usual, so they do not get pushed back as easily and might drift in local patterns that, in stacks of images, look sunward. A few even ask if electric or magnetic effects could play a small role. But the simplest physics, the kind we like to teach, does not yet wrap all of this in a neat bow. When things seem strange, scientists try to rule out mistakes. Could the stacked images have introduced false patterns? Could background stars or galaxies have fooled the algorithms? Did calibration and subtraction of light from other sources leave behind a ghost that looks like a real signal? For this object, teams went back and checked their pipelines. They used different telescopes. They compared results across groups who do not share software. The anomalies kept showing up. That does not mean error is impossible. It does mean the signals are hard to dismiss as tricks. Once you accept that, it becomes easier to consider a few what-if ideas as long as you keep them tied to data. One what-if is that the object is a natural analogue of a solar sail, a flake or sheet from a much larger parent body that shattered long ago. If it is thin and light and reflective, the push from sunlight could be big enough to matter even far from the sun. That might help explain the early non-gravitational acceleration and the light curve rhythm if the sheet presents different area as it turns. Another what-if is about exotic ices. Not every star system makes comets that look like ours. Some bodies may hold nitrogen ice or carbon monoxide ice under a tough outer shell. Those ices might vent only at certain temperatures or angles, creating jets late rather than early. That could explain the delayed cyanogen, the timing mismatch and even out-of-line pushes now and then. A third idea is a debris flotilla, not in the sense of a swamp around this object now, but as the history of a broken world. Maybe this is one shard of many drifting through space and we happen to catch this one because it glowed more than its siblings. Each idea asks for more proof, each is dramatic in its own way, none is proven today. Meanwhile, the numbers are the numbers. The nucleus is likely between a few hundred meters and a few kilometers. The speed near the sun will be about 68 kilometers per second. The passes by Mars and Venus are already lined up in time and space in the models. The light curve shows a steady beat. The spectrum lacked the usual gas early on and then whispered a bit later. There is a measured push not explained by gravity alone, at least not in simple versions of it. It's a lot to hold in your head. It's also why this object is not just interesting, but important. It pushes our models and our habits. The time around December 17th will be a test. Telescopes on the ground and in space will try to watch as often as weather and schedules allow. Amateur astronomers will try for longer runs to catch the rhythm in the light. Pros will aim big mirrors at the spectrum to see if cyanogen and diatomic carbon finally rise or if new gases show up. Cameras will look hard at the tail's shape. Astrometry, the careful measuring of position, will track whether the non-gravitational acceleration keeps pointing in the same direction or changes as the geometry changes. Polarimetry, which studies how light is polarized by dust, may help tell what sizes and structures the grains have. If the object is close enough and bright enough, radar might even try to bounce a signal off it, though that's hard. Every piece will help, either by confirming what we think or by forcing us to rethink. Some people online wonder why certain files are restricted or slow to appear. It's normal in science for raw AI outputs, detailed spectral fits, and some early models to stay private until teams are sure. Peer review takes time, calibration takes time. It is not a cover-up to be careful. At the same time, mystery grows naturally when updates are slow and the story is exciting. Clear communication helps. For now, the fair reading is this. Teams are working, the data is being checked, and new releases will come when confidence is high. The question everyone wants to ask, even if they know it won't be answered today, is whether this could be a craft. The honest answer is that there is no good evidence for that. Extraordinary claims need extraordinary proof, controlled signals, maneuvers that match no natural forces, a structure that is clearly not built by nature. None of that is on the table. What we have is a set of unusual natural looking clues that do not yet fit a simple picture. That is enough to make the story great, that does not make it a visit from someone else. We can keep our minds open while keeping our feet on the ground. If it is natural, the story is still wonderful. Imagine a thin reflective shard from a world we will never see, broken off in a violent event millions or billions of years ago, coasting through the dark, passing between stars and at last gliding through our inner solar system where our telescopes can catch a few sharp frames before it disappears again. 
इमेजिन आइसिस वी डोंट ऑफन सी हेयर हिडन अंडर अ क्रस्ट वेटिंग फॉर जस्ट द राइट एंगल टू वेंट इमेजिन अ शेप दैट कैच इज सनलाइट इन अ वे अवर सिंपल मॉडल्स डिड नॉट एक्सपेक्ट ईच ऑफ दीज पिक्चर्स टीच इज अ समथिंग ईच वुड फोर्स द टेक्सट बुक्स टू एड अ न्यू फिगर और अ न्यू फुट नोट दैट इज हाउ साइंस ग्रोज नॉट बाय टेयरिंग डाउन वॉट वी नो बट बाय स्ट्रेचिंग इट टू इंक्लूड वॉट वी हैड नॉट मेट बिफोर देर इज ऑल्सो अ ह्यूमन साइड टू ऑल ऑफ दिस it lives in the long nights and the hum of cooling fans in observatories in coffee fueled meetings in tired eyes watching a trace on a screen it is in the moment when an algorithm highlights a regular beat and a researcher's heart beats a little faster too it is in a short email that says please check this and in the rush to compare notes across time zones it is in the patience to read and code and the courage to share odd results it is in the smile when a faint cyanogen line finally rises above the noise after weeks of nothing These small human moments are the steps of a larger climb towards understanding. They are the quiet center of a loud bright universe. We can already make a short list of what we want to learn next even without any special labels. We want to know if the heartbeat in the light stays put or shifts with distance. We want to know if the sunward dust feature remains or fades. We want to see whether more gases appear as it warms near the sun and then cools again. We want to measure whether the non-gravitational push turns in a way that follows the shape and spin of the body or if it stays doubled off in its own direction. We want to know if the size estimate tightens enough to tell us if a thin sheet model is even possible. And we want to keep looking for patterns we have not thought of because some of the best discoveries are the ones no one predicted. There is a lovely balance in the way this story teaches. On one side, it reminds us that our simple rules are only simple summaries. Nature is allowed to be messy. Dust can be larger than usual. Surfaces can be crusted and cracked. Light can push more than we thought if the surface is just right. On the other hand, it tells us to be careful about reading too much into weirdness. A strange path can be rare but not being designed. A steady pulse can be natural even if we don't immediately see why. The best posture is curiosity without panic. When December comes, many eyes will turn upward. Most people won't see anything with the naked eye. The object will not be a bright torch in the sky. it will be a faint thing needing patience instruments but the meaning of that moment is bigger than brightness it's a test of ideas it's an audience for a silent visitor it's a reminder that we live in a moving changing system open to surprises however this story ends it will leave a mark if the object settles into a normal comet pattern near the sun then we will say it tricked us for a while and we figured it out if the odd behavior continues the next round of models will be even more inventive and the next round of observations even more careful both paths are wins because both paths add knowledge there is something wonderful about a puzzle that refuses to be solved too quickly it keeps us honest it keeps us listening